Welcome and thanks for checking out the Hub Word at Hubbard United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Lauren Hauger and I'm just so delighted that you've decided to join us today. The Hub Word is designed to offer an abbreviated worship experience for those of you who might not have enough time to watch an entire service, but you still want to hear the Word of God each week. If you are in the Park Rapids area, I would love to invite you to join us on Sundays at 9 a.m. Or you can also join us on our live stream at HubbardUMC.org. You know what? Prior services can also be viewed on our website and on our YouTube channel. So I hope you can check those out as well. Again, we are just so thrilled that you've decided to join us. And I hope that you are blessed by this week's message. say that was the perfect segue into the lesson for today. Today's scripture comes from Genesis chapter 1, the world's creation in seven days. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was without shape or form. It was dark over the deep sea, and God's wind swept over the waters. God said, let there be light, and so light appeared. God saw how good the light was. God separated the light from the darkness. God named the light day and the darkness night. There was evening and there was morning the first day. 
God said, let there be a dome in the middle of the waters to separate the waters from each other. God made the dome and separated the waters under the dome from the waters above the dome, and it happened in that way. God named the dome sky. There was evening and there was morning, the second day. God said, let the waters under the sky come together into one place so that the dry land can appear. And that's what happened. God named the dry land earth, and he named the gathered waters seas. God saw how good it was. God said, let the earth grow plant life, plants yielding seeds and fruit trees bearing fruit with seeds inside it, each according to its kind throughout the earth. And that's what happened. The earth produced plant life, plants yielding seeds, each according to its kind, and trees bearing fruit with seeds inside it, each according to its kind. God saw how good it was. There was evening and there was morning, the third day. God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. They will mark events, sacred seasons, days, and years. They will be lights in the dome of the sky to shine on the earth. And that's what happened. God made the stars in two great lights, the larger light to rule over the day and the smaller light to rule over the night. God put them in the dome of the sky to shine on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. God saw how good it was. There was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. God said, let the waters swarm with living things and let birds fly above the earth up in the dome of the sky. God created the great sea animals and all the tiny living things that swarm in the waters, each according to its kind and all the winged birds, each according to its kind. God saw how good it was. Then God blessed them. Be fertile and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. There was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. God said, let the earth produce every kind of living thing, livestock, crawling things, and wildlife. And that's what happened. God made every kind of wildlife, every kind of livestock, and every kind of creature that crawls on the ground. God saw how good it was. Then God said, let us make humanity in our image to resemble us so that they may take charge of the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the earth, and all the crawling things on earth. God created humanity in God's own image. In the divine image, God created them. Male and female, God created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fertile and multiply. Fill the earth and master it. Take charge of the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, and everything crawling on the ground. Then God said, I now give to you all the plants on the earth that yield seeds and all the trees whose fruit produces, produces its seeds within it. These will be your food to everything that breathes. I give all the green grasses for food. And that's what happened. God saw everything he had made. It was supremely good. This is there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Liz. That's not an easy task, that whole chapter. Well, once upon a time, there lived a girl with a magic book. And like many other books, this one told tales of kings and queens and farmers and warriors and giants and sea monsters and dangerous voyages. 
But unlike any other book, it cast a spell over all who read it. They were pulled into the story, cast as characters in an epic story full of danger and surprise. From the book, the girl learned how to be brave like a shepherd boy, David, clever like a poor peasant, Ruth, and charming like the beautiful Queen Esther. She learned that with enough faith, you could topple a giant with a slingshot, turn water into wine, and survive three whole days inside the belly of a fish. You could even wrestle an angel. She learned how to defend the book against its enemies, fashion the book into a, a weapon if she wanted, wielding its truth like a sword. When the girl met a teacher named Jesus in the story, she promised to love and follow him forever. Jesus taught her how to care for the poor, be kind to the lonely, forgive the bullies, and listen to her mother. But then one day, the story began to unravel. The girl was older now, with a more mature and curious mind, and she noticed some things that she hadn't before. Like how God rewarded the chosen patriarch Abraham for, for obeying God's request that he sacrifice his own son. Or how God permitted the chosen people of Israel to kidnap women and girls as spoils of war. Or how the story of all the earth's animals taking refuge in this giant ark, once one of the girl's favorite stories, began with a God so sorry for creating life, he simply wanted it all washed away. I mean, if God was supposed to be the hero of this story, then why did God behave like a villain? If the book was supposed to explain all the mysteries of life, why did it leave her with so many questions? Perhaps the girl reasoned that the story wasn't true after all. Perhaps she feared her book wasn't magic. With each question, the voice of God grew quieter and the voices of others grew louder. These were dangerous questions, they said, forbidden questions, especially for a girl. Words and stories that once captured her imagination now triggered her doubts and her darkest fears. It was as if the roots of her beloved and familiar trees had risen up to, to block her path, and there was no map for a world suddenly rearranged, no incantation of light to light the road ahead. And she was lost. And yet the spell remained unbroken. The characters, many more sinister now, wandered in and out of her life just as before, interrupting her work, her relationships, and her plans. She couldn't get the ancient songs out of her head, and she was still caught up in that story. As a very young child, I remember vaguely swimming in the stories of Scripture as a fish swims in the sea. And the evangelical subculture of the 60s and 70s produced no shortage of Bible-themed books and videos. So along with the cast of Sesame Street and Disney princesses, the figures of Moses and Miriam and Abraham and Isaac, you know, they were marched through my imagination. I mean, do you remember the Gumby-like claymation cartoon Davy and Goliath? You remember that? You remember Davy, a, a, a young boy and his dog Goliath, and in each episode, Davy would end up in a bind of sorts, and Goliath would act as his sort of conscience, helping to guide him through it. Facing situations in every episode where having faith in God would help the characters overcome a challenge. Or perhaps you remember Salty, the singing songbook from the 60, or 70s and 80s, and embedding praise songs into our brains that we will never forget, even if we try. Or the VeggieTales characters of the 90s that my son actually grew up with, and I'm certain you remember these healthy characters, these little storytellers, Bob the Tomato and Larry the Cucumber, Junior Asparagus and Petunia Rhubarb. And of all the movies they made, my personal favorite, Beauty and the Beat. And I even remember my first Bible. It was one of those precious moments volumes that boasted, you know, blonde, doe-eyed David on the cover with two baby lambs resting in his arms and a sparrow perched up on his staff. 
And inside were all my favorite biblical characters. I mean, those characters occupied a similar space in my brain as often as, as Abraham Lincoln, Bud Grant, and various dead relatives whose antics were conjured up at family gatherings from time to time. They were mythic, yet real. True, yet more than true. The stories were ones in which every other story belonged. They were the moral universe through which all of life's drama moved. And I mean, so convinced was I that I inhabited the same reality as Lot's wife that I refused for years to look out the rear window of the Oldsmobile Custom Cruiser station wagon for fear of turning into a pillar of salt. Well, if the Bible of my childhood functioned primarily as a storybook, then the Bible of my adolescence functioned like a handbook, much like my Girl Scout handbook. Useful because it told me what I should do. I mean, if I had a question about friendships or dating or school, body image or any a number of adolescent concerns, it would never fail to provide me with an answer. And if the Bible of my childhood functioned as a storybook and the Bible of my adolescence then functioned as a handbook, well, the Bible of my young adulthood functioned as an answer book or a position paper, right? Useful because it was the truth. It was right. The Bible I learned from others near and dear uh, was the reason that all true Christians voted for Republicans, rejected evolution, and opposed same-sex marriage. It was the reason I could never, as a woman, be a pastor. It was a biblical worldview that would prepare me to be able to debate atheists and agnostics and would equip me to engage in the moral confusion of a postmodern culture. The more I learned about scripture, they said, the more confident I would grow in my faith and the better I would be at answering the world's questions. But their assurances, however sincerely intended, proved empty when, as a young adult, then I started questioning for myself. Portions I had been told which were clearly biblical, young earth, creationism, restrictions on women's roles in the home and the church, the certainty of hell for all non-believers, they grew muddier and muddier in the mix of my lived experience. And the more I spent, more time I spent seeking clarity from scripture, the more problems I ended up uncovering and the more questions I had. And so then the Bible of my 20s served as a stumbling block, a massive obstacle between me and the God I thought I knew. It was as if the evangelical community that surrounded me, my friends and professors and teachers, all treated me like a wildfire needing containment. The harder my fellow Christians worked to minimize my objections and questions, the more pronounced those objections became, and I sensed this deep insecurity. Instead of bolstering my confidence in the Bible, its most strident defenders inadvertently weakened it. Then when a pastor friend asked me which of my personal sins might have triggered my questions, I knew that my journey through these doubts, was going to be a lonely one. I would leave my faith a dozen times in the years following, only to return a dozen more. Beneath the incessant hum of objections and corrections and clarifications lay a terrible silence, wherein the Bible still fascinated me, but no longer spoke to me, at least not with the voice of God. The Bible remained not just a stumbling block, but a fixture now, cold and mute. My journey back to loving the Bible, like most journeys of faith, is a meandering and an ongoing one. The story still in draft. And like all pilgrims, I am indebted to those who have gone before me, those saints of holy curiosity whose lives of faithful questioning taught me not to fear my doubts, but to embrace and to learn from them. Writer, uh, writer Addie Zierman, who writes a Dear Addie uh, advice column for people who have left legalistic religious backgrounds, 
once advised a reader to think of the Bible not as one of those magic eye books, you know, the ones that if you squint enough and you study enough, they reveal a hidden image. But instead of it, think of it as a song that can be covered and remixed by a variety of artists. Find your favorite cover artist, she wrote. Find the voices that help you hear the same songs differently. So over the past 15 years, I have discovered my own cover artists, those scholars and poets, traditions and practices that help make the Bible sing for me. From the rich history of Jewish interpretation, I learned the mysteries and contradictions of scripture weren't meant to be fought against, but courageously engaged. And the Bible, by its very nature, invites us to wrestle and doubt and imagine and debate. Scholar Peter Enns has encouraged me to approach scripture with a new set of, uh, of questions, questions like, what if the Bible is just fine the way it is? Not the well-behaved, everything in is, is in order version that we create, but the messy, troubling, weird, and ancient Bible that we actually have. You know, these questions have loosened my grip on the text and have given me permission to love the Bible for what it is, not for what I want it to be. You know, uh, and here's the surprising thing about that, friends. When you stop trying to force the Bible into being something that it's not, static, certain, and absolute, then you're free to revel in what it is, living and breathing, confounding, surprising, and yes, perhaps even magic. The ancient rabbis likened scripture to palace, to a palace, alive and bustling and full of grand halls and banquet rooms and secret passages and locked doors. The adventure lies in learning the secrets of the palace, unlocking all the doors and perhaps catching a glimpse of the king in all the king's glory. In those first formative years of my life, before I knew or cared about culture wars, or genre categories, or biblical inter interpretation. I mean, this is what scripture taught me. That a boat full of animals can survive a catastrophic flood. That seas could be parted and lions tamed. That girls could be prophets and warriors and queens. That a kid's lunch of fish and bread can be multiplied to feed 5,000 people. At times, I wonder if I understood my sacred text better then than I do now or ever will again. And so now, at 61, after years of tangling with the Bible, I have every expectation that I'm going to tangle with it forever. So I just read these words to you as if they were my own. Because, in fact, they very well could have been. But what I actually read to you were large portions of the introduction of this book, Inspired, the book that we are using as a companion in this worship series. The book, I said, uh, was written by Rachel Held Evans, and she's a woman who was raised in the South in the 80s and 90s, and a woman who was raised in the evangelical Christian culture and who, very much like me, absolutely loved the Bible um, as a young kid. I could easily relate to what she said about the characters of the Bible and living in the same place as her mind as Sesame Street and who, like me, went on to be a Christian leader in her own right. And then who also, like me, began to ask hard questions after lived experience taught us both that easy answers were not quite enough to stay in love with God. And uh, she was a woman who, like me, was ostracized and, and left alone with her questions and who, like me, walked away from her magical Bible of her childhood, childhood and, until then we both rediscovered resurrection. And who, like me, then returned to the Bible, and not with this childlike, whimsical innocence, but instead with a sturdy foundation of faith. A faith that's based on scripture and shaped by tradition and informed by experience and confirmed then by reason. You know, I read parts of this introduction just because just like Rachel Held Evans, this could be my 
origin story. You know, when I first read it, I was sitting in my office over here a few feet away, and by page three, I was in tears because I had never really heard my own relationship with the Bible explained quite in the same way like she described it. By the end of the introduction, I actually just had to put the book down and I had to simply feel all of my feelings, which anyone who knows me knows this is not what I like to do. I remembered my journey with the Bible mirrored in these words, and I remembered my younger self enamored by the fantastic stories of the Bible, like the first creation story that you, you just heard Liz read. You know, even today when Genesis 1 is read, I can visualize God in the form of the Spirit hovering over the waters, forming the shape of the planet, breathing life into every plant and animal. I see little buds on flowers starting to bloom for the very first time. I see leaves of grass coming up from the ground for the very first time. I see the beautiful sunset on the, on the very first day of what we know of as, as life. And it is beautiful and it is good. The book of Genesis actually translates to mean origin or creation or beginning. Genesis is the book of the Bible which first introduces us to Yahweh uh, and, and which establishes our religious ancestors' relationship to God. For, for ancient people's origin stories were the way they explained the world. If you do a little searching, you could find origin stories from across time and culture which explain how the world came to be, why it rains, where the sun goes at night, the beginnings of the Jewish faith even. I mean, a lot of origin stories describe how humanity came to be and, and what their connection was with God or, or the many gods that they worshipped at that time. You know, in fact, if you have time this week, I recommend that you look up some of those origin stories from different cultures around the world. And, and I think you're going to be surprised at the similarities to the stories that you'll find in Genesis. And the way that early cultures, uh, like the Babylonian and the Akkadian empires, you know, explained the beginning of, the, uh, of creation. And this is because throughout different times and cultures and locations, early humans were all searching for answers to, to many of the same questions about who they were, why they're here, and how they came to be. And, and they found those answers in mythology and poetry, and storytelling, and from the wise ones among them, and from those who had come before them. You see, the thing is, we've lost much of the cultural understanding and the context clues that ancient people used to interpret these stories. Over time, says Rachel, we've been instructed to reject any trace of poetry, or myth, or hyperbole, or symbolism, even when those literary forms are virtually shouting at us from the page and talking about talking serpents and enchanted trees. That's because there's a curious but popular notion circulating around the church these days that says God would never, ever stoop down to using ancient genre to communicate. You know, that speaking to ancient people using their own language, literary structures and cosmological assumptions would be beneath God. So even though many Christians have used the story in Genesis to disprove scientific findings, I believe that the book of Genesis shouldn't be used that way. Because it doesn't define or describe the historically accurate picture of all creation because it was never meant to. I mean, the early writers of the Hebrew religious text weren't concerned with the same things we are today. They weren't discussing the Big Bang or black holes or atoms or evolution. Genesis is and was meant to be a book that holds the mystery and wonder found in a story of a group of people and their relationship to God. Okay, so if we shouldn't use this creation story in Genesis as a scientific uh, way of telling how the world was created, then what can we take away from it? Well, for me, the most important takeaway is a better understanding of who God is 
and how God cares for humanity. In our creation story, we find a God who's actively engaged in the act of designing our world, doing the hard work of putting things together and finding them to be good. We find the story of a God that instructs humanity to care for the earth and for each other. And along with all of that, we find a deeper and richer understanding of who God is. You know, Western Christianity's emphasis on trying to read the ancient Hebrew origin stories as history rather than poetry and myth and symbolism, you know, it overlooks something very important. As Rachel puts it, it's one of the most central themes of Scripture itself. And that is that God stoops from walking with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden to traveling with the liberated Hebrew slaves in a pillar of cloud and fire to slipping into flesh and eating and laughing and suffering and healing and weeping and dying among us as part of humanity. The God of Scripture stoops and stoops and stoops and stoops. At the heart of the gospel message is the story of a God who stoops, even to the point of death on a cross. You know, dignified or not, believable or not, ours is a God perpetually on bended knee, friends, doing everything it takes to convince stubborn and petulant children that they are seen and loved. This is who God is. This is what God does. Friends, our culture is very different than the one described in the book of Genesis. It's very different than the society that Jesus was born into or, or that the early church was created in. But by reading the stories of the origins of our faith, we too can be reminded of who God is. You know, the Bible's original readers may not share our culture, but they do share our humanity. And the God they worshipped invited them to bring that humanity into their theology and their prayers and their songs and their stories, just as God invites us to do the same. And at the end of her introduction, Rachel Held Evans says this, Inspiration on both the giving and receiving end takes practice and patience. It means showing up when you don't feel like it. It means uh, even when it seems as if there is nobody else there, we need to show up. It means waiting for the wind to stir. So as we continue to study the Bible over the next couple of months, may we remember a few important things. May we remember that God is revealed in its pages through the eyes, perspectives, and stories of human beings People whose culture was different than ours and whose understanding of the world was different than ours, but who share a common humanity with us. May we remember that the Bible describes a God who created us with love, who is with us throughout the good and the bad, and who is still speaking to us through interpretation and study and wrestling with our sacred text. And may we remember that God is still breathing, a Bible is inspired and inspiring. And our job is to ready the sails and gather the embers to discuss and debate. And like the biblical character Jacob, you can wrestle with the mystery until God gives us a blessing. You know, if you're curious, you're, you're never going to leave the text without learning something new. If you're persistent, you just might leave inspired. May it be so.